Hi, I'm Jeanette Roche. This is Bridge City News. Here are some of the top stories we've been following. As the investigation into the attempted assassination of Donald Trump continues, Trump says he plans to announce his pick for a running mate. Plus, demonstrators gather outside the Republican National Convention Monday saying there's no noticeable change in security since Saturday's shooting. And the trial continues into its final week in Lethbridge for two men facing charges of conspiracy to murder police. Your nation. Your province. Your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Jeanette Roche. Thanks for joining us. The FBI is investigating Saturday's shooting at a Trump rally in Pennsylvania as an attempted assassination and act of domestic terror. However, authorities say a motive has not yet been identified. We are investigating this as, a, as an assassination attempt, but also looking at it as a, a potential domestic terrorism act. So our counterterrorism division and our criminal divisions are working, working jointly together uh, to determine uh, the motive uh, in this case. The American people can rest assured that we will leave no stone unturned as we work to get to the bottom of what happened. As the investigation continues, the Republican National Convention kicked off today in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where Trump earned enough delegate votes to become the official Republican presidential nominee. He has also selected Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as his running mate. Meanwhile, demonstrators gathered outside the Republican National Convention today, some saying there has not been a noticeable change in security since the assassination attempt on Trump's life Saturday. I don't think safety levels have increased from one day to the next because of that issue. Uh, you know, it's America's a dangerous place with all the flooded guns, and I realize this, but I'm not going to let that silence my voice. Party Chairman Michael Watley says programming at the National Committee wouldn't be changed after the attempt on Trump's life Saturday night, but Trump has rewritten, re rewritten rather the speech he will give on Thursday. Hours before the first convention session, the former U.S. president got some news that the federal judge presiding over his classified documents case dismissed the case due to concerns over the appointment of the prosecutor. Trump posted on his Truth Social platform calling for the dismissal of his other legal cases. But it did not stop protesters from voicing their opinions. I think Donald Trump should be held accountable for the crimes he has committed, crimes as defined by his actions, actions that are listed in the criminal statutes as crimes. A former classmate of the man suspected of attempting to assassinate the former president says the 20-year-old was frequently bullied and sat alone at lunchtime at their high school in Bethel Park, Pennsylvania. Fine. Did you ever have any interactions with Thomas and shared classes in high school? No, I didn't have any classes with him. Um, I had my only interactions with him were just seeing him in school and he was bullied, uh, sat alone at lunch. Kind of stood out as a bit of a loner. Yeah. Was that ever anything that might have been worrying to you or might have rang well, any alarm bells? I mean, yeah, but that's not something you want to think about. Like, that, you don't want to have that first thought in your head, like, he's a little off. Is he going to do something? Like, you don't. So it's kind of just puts it to the back of your head. And the former president is receiving support from many of his political opponents, including current U.S. President Joe Biden, who is calling for civility in politics. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari says while Biden may have said the right things, it is too little too late. And we've also heard from you know, President, former President Obama um, and, and, and many others in the political um, arena about this. And they all said the right things. They all tweeted the right things. Um, but many people are upset because they feel as though you can write a book of all the tweets, all the commentary, all the speeches that have been made by very high-ranking Democrats that have called President Trump a threat to democracy. They have called him a literal Hitler. They have said, you know, he's a tyrant. He's a dictator. He's going to uh, change the course of American history and creating an environment where, well, if he's Hitler, he has to be killed. And if I do that, I'm doing society a favor. Catch my full interview with the Foreign Desk's Lisa Deftari coming up after business news. The criminal mischief trial against Freedom Convoy organizer Pat King won't resume until Wednesday at the earliest because his lawyer needed an adjournment for personal reasons. 
and the Crown says King won't be testifying. King, who is from Red Deer, Alberta, has pleaded not guilty to mischief, counseling others to commit mischief, obstructing police and other offenses related to his role in the three-week-long protest that gridlocked downtown Ottawa for more than three weeks in 2022. As the trial for Anthony Olianik and Chris Carbert enters its last week, many supporters for the two men have been showing up to the Lethbridge courthouse in hopes that they're found innocent, including some familiar faces. Landon Hickok is back at the courthouse and has shared his conversation with Pastor Arthur Polowski. Landon? That's right. I'm back at the Lethbridge Courthouse where we are continuing the trial of Anthony Olenek and Chris Carbert. Now, today we have gone through more witness testimonies. We've gone through three alone this morning, uh, including singer and songwriter Lindsay Butler, uh, who was there to perform at the Coos Border Blockade, and that of Travis Lonsbury, a friend of Jerry Morin. However, none of the three really had extraordinary connections with Olenek or Carbert. Now today, since we expect that this is the final week of the, tr of the trial, which we expect the verdict to come this coming Friday, we've seen a lot of supporters come into the trial room, including uh, Reverend Pastor Arthur Polowski, who was uh, arrested many times back during the COVID-19 pandemic in supposed breaches of the restrictions given by the provincial and federal governments. I had the privilege and honor of speaking to him uh, right after the trial, and he had some thoughts to share, share on this trial and a big lawsuit he has coming up this coming Thursday. Take a look. What I'm seeing right now is the process has become the punishment. Um, truth is irrelevant. Um, Crown Prosecutor Stephen, Stephen Johnston is making stuff up, portraying good patriots as some kind of criminals. That's unacceptable. That's not why we came here. That's not what, uh, why Canada was, was formed. It was supposed to be a, a nation of freedom, liberty, and uh, you know, pursuit of justice. Justice is gone. It's a show. It's a political theater. It's a show trial. We filed the biggest lawsuit in the history of this country. I'm suing Attorney General of Canada. We're going after the Chief of Police Newfield. We're going after the Calgary Police Department, RCMP Department, Riemann Center, um, all kinds of Alberta Health Services, of course, for what they have done to us. And of course, now, years later, we have all the facts and the real science and the evidence that what was done to us peaceful Canadians was unlawful. And as mentioned earlier, we can expect the verdict to come this coming Friday on the 19th as more supporters come in and fill the courtroom to show their support to both Anthony Olenek and Chris Carbert. As more updates come, we'll keep you posted on what happens next here on Bridge City News. The truck driver responsible for the 2018 Humboldt Broncos bus crash in Saskatchewan that killed 16 and injured 13 others has applied to regain his permanent resident status on humanitarian grounds. The Immigration and Refugee Board issued a deportation order for May in, uh, in May for Jaskarit Singh Sidhu and his status was revoked. Sidhu's lawyer says his client's wife and son are both Canadian citizens and the child has health problems, which should help his case. Members of a veterans motorcycle club were asked to leave after police showed up at a Lethbridge charity event this past weekend. As BCN's Brett Brown reports, the members of the Commandos Motorcycle Club attended the fourth annual outdoor music fest and barbecue at Honkers Pub and Eatery Saturday on July 13th. According to Honkers owner Vicki Vandenhoek, club members were there to support the Veterans Association Food Bank of Lethbridge, who was the beneficiary of the event. We did have a motorcycle club come in, the Commandos. Um, they were fine. They donated money and bought a pop and a burger and everything, and they were really great. And then all of a sudden, we had like 12 police officers in full armor come in and said that they needed to go because they came in as a group with their cuts. It's just preventing problems, it was what I was told. So, of course, as the owner, I have to go with whatever the law tells me I need to do. Right. And unfortunately, they were, they were great guys and contributing to our charity event, but they had to leave. According to Vandenhoek, members of the commandos left peacefully when asked to do so by police. A member of the commandos who did not want to be identified said the motorcycle club is made up of retired soldiers who support veterans and their families. The Lethbridge Police Service says it, along with its policing partners, visited approximately 100 licensed establishments to conduct checks 
under the Alberta Gaming, Liquor and Cannabis Act. Police say the act enables the exclusion and removal of gang members from licensed establishments. About 50 individuals met the definition of gang members under the act, according to police, including 20 at Honkers Pub and Eatery. Vanden Hook says the charity event was a big success, raising over $3,000 for the Veterans Association Food Bank. For Bridge City News, I'm Brett Brown. A new program that uses artificial intelligence is being implemented by the City of Lethbridge so that residential waste streams are maintained and in optimal condition. The intelligent system checks residential recycling and organic carts to find materials that should not be placed in those containers. James Nichols, Waste and Collection Manager with the City of Lethbridge, says this is a one-year pilot and he also explains how the screening works. See up here, there's three distinct cameras. So there's one here on the bottom of the truck that's actually reading a serial number. So it's an additional verification process to ensure that you can see I am collecting cart from 123 Main Street. When that cart is actually lifted up into the hopper of the truck where the materials are collected, there are two additional cameras that are actually looking for that contamination. So once the material has been deposited into the hopper, that camera up at the very top is looking directly down, capturing the materials that are being deposited into the hopper. And then at the end of the day, that imagery is then sent in to the system. AI detection technology is utilized to review that, uh, that footage to determine if any of those materials, such as bag materials, yard waste, uh, garbage, household hazardous waste, is in fact in that cart. At that point, that's where we're then collecting those postcards and sending them out to residents. Uh, what we're looking for mainly are things like bag materials, um, household hazardous waste, so batteries, lithium-ion batteries are becoming more and more of an issue, um, tires, uh, as well as yard waste materials, so organic materials that should actually be making their way into the green cart. Nichols says as soon as an inappropriate material is found in the blue or green cart, a notification will be sent to the house where it was found, so this behavior is not repeated in the next collection. They will be notified that if the behavior continues and uh, lose access to the blue cart, which will increase the cost of disposing garbage for that particular household. Lethbridge Police has revealed statistics on a busy weekend in, on Lethbridge Street with the arrival of the Hells Angels and the popular Street Wheelers event. LPS has announced that two people were arrested in connection with the arrival of over 300 Hells Angels, including one with an outstanding arrest and another for assaulting a peace officer. During a Street Wheelers, police issued 154 violation tickets for mainly stunting and equipment violation, 10 people arrested with seven on criminal code charges and the removal of five impaired drivers from the road. Police would like to thank the majority of participants for acting and driving responsibly throughout the weekend. The greatest outdoor show on earth has wrapped up for the year, but it hit an all-time attendance record despite the challenges of water restrictions and heat warnings. Nearly one and a half million people walked through the gates. While the busiest day on the fairgrounds was on July 7th, Family Day, the organization is reporting that 1,477,953 people visited the grounds during the last 10 days. Wow, pretty impressive. And speaking of stampede, at least four animals had to be euthanized during this past week's rodeo. A horse was put down after suffering a racing related injury during the chuck wagon races Saturday night at the Stampede. This following the injury of two other horses that had to be euthanized earlier in the week during the chuck wagons. A steer was also euthanized after being injured in a steer wrestling competition. Well, Calgary's mayor says outdoor water restrictions are to remain in place for now. Jody Gondek says the city will consider lifting the ban on Thursday if the new pipe is st stabilized by then. She says engineers are to work cautiously over the next three days, increasing water pressure in the pipe from 50% to 70% to not overwhelm the pipe. The city's 1.6 million residents have been banned from using their sprinklers and hoses to water gardens since a major water feeder main burst on July the 5th. 
A pro-Palestinian encampment on the University of Manitoba grounds has been dismantled more than two months after it was set up. Tents and other items are gone from the open grassy area this morning on the campus in South Winnipeg. And university officials say the protesters left peacefully and university, the university had threatened legal action if the encampment remained beyond 8 o'clock this morning. Meanwhile, protesters remained on campus at Vancouver Island University, even though the school's deadline for them to leave had also expired. Protesters say they remain steadfast and that by issuing the deadline, the university has chosen to put students at risk. Wildfires in Newfoundland have forced the temporary shutdown of iron ore mines. Over the weekend, both Champion Iron and Iron Ore announced they are temporarily halting operations as forest fires burn just north of their locations in Labrador City. On Friday, residents in that area were ordered to evacuate by the provincial government due to extreme fire activity. Two major soccer championships were won over the weekend. Lotaro Martinez scored in the 112th minute to give Argentina a 1-0 victory over Colombia in the Copa America championship match Sunday night. The match was delayed by 90 minutes due to pre-game security issues at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami Gardens, Florida. Canada finished fourth in the tourney after on penalties to Uruguay on Saturday. And meanwhile, Spain won a record fourth European Championship title on Sunday after Mikel Oyarzabal, uh, 86th minute goal, clinched a two to one victory over England. It was an unexpectedly tragic week for Hollywood as it mourns five of its stars who passed away, including Shelley Duvall, who starred in The Shining. She died in her sleep July 11th at the age of 75. Other deaths over the last few days included celebrity sex therapist Dr. Ruth Westheimer, who was 96 at the time of her passing July 12th. Fitness guru Richard Simmons was found dead in his Los Angeles home, believed to have passed away from natural causes one day following his 76th birthday. And actress Shannon Doherty of the 90s hit show Beverly Hills 90210 and Charmed died over the weekend after a lengthy battle with breast cancer at the age of 53. Also, James Sicking, one of the stars of the 1980s hit TV show Hill Street Blues, passed away this weekend. He was 90 and died of complications from dementia. And the world of sports took a blow this weekend as well as retired NFL star Jacoby Jones was found dead in his Houston, Texas home on Sunday. Some very sad news there. Our prayers, of course, go out to all of their loved ones. We do need to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with a look at the weather picture across the nation. Welcome back. A very warm forecast is in our future here in Lethbridge. As we can see temperatures jumping from 29 today, back up into the 30s and even the mid 30s as we get closer to that weekend. So seeing highs of 30 tomorrow on Tuesday up to 31 Wednesday, 30 degrees again on Thursday, 33 Friday, and then all the way up to 34 and 35 on the weekend there, Saturday and Sunday. Could see a slight chance of showers on Thursday as well. Now, average high for this time of year, 26 degrees. We're jumping well above that. Low for this time of year is 10 degrees, 35. That was our high temperature. That was our record breaker back in 1996 on this day. And on this day back in uh, 1999, we were sitting at only two degrees, hard to believe. Okay, sunrise this morning at 541, looking at a sunset this evening at 9.33 p.m., giving us 15 hours, 51 minutes of daylight. Okay, looking at the West Coast tomorrow, clear skies, high of 26 in Victoria, a lovely 25 in Vancouver, gonna feel a little bit hotter than that. The further inland you go, more like 28. Uh, so there is also heat warnings uh, back in effect in uh, Edmonton and Calgary for the next eight to 10 days. Looking at a high of 31 in Edmonton tomorrow, 28 for the high in Calgary under sunny skies. As we get to the rest of the prairies, uh, we are look looking also at some warm conditions. Saskatoon sitting at 26, 25 in Regina and 21 degrees in Winnipeg under clear sunny skies. As we get to the central part of the country, we are seeing uh, slight chances of uh, showers with risks of thunderstorms, but warm as well. 29 in Toronto, same thing for Ottawa, and a high of 27 degrees tomorrow expected in Montreal. Now out on the east coast, we are still seeing that prolonged 
heat event. Uh, we're expecting to see that right through Wednesday and along with some precipitation and risks of thunderstorms in many of these cities. 27 for a high in Fredericton, 29 in Halifax, also in Charlottetown, and 26 is the expected high tomorrow in St. John's with a mix of sun and clouds. So there you have it, that is your forecast. As revenue declines from what they call a challenging, adversing environment, Chorus Entertainment, which houses brands like Global News and YTV, is, quote, aggressively cutting costs, continuing layoffs, and shutting down parts of its business. Co-Chief Executive Officer John Gosling said the company expects to have slashed 25% of its full-time workforce by the end of next month, compared with the beginning of its 2023 fiscal year. By the end of May, Chorus had cut about 500 employees. The company will also stop operating two AM radio stations in Vancouver and Edmonton. Chorus reported 331.8 uh, million in revenue from March through May, a decrease of more than $65 million from the same period last year. Upcoming June inflation data could open the door to a second Bank of Canada rate cut, according to some economists. Stats Canada is set to release its consumer price index figures for last month on Tuesday. Inflation accelerated to 2.9% annual annually in May, a move that surprised most economists who had expected the CPI would continue to follow the cooling trends seen through much of 2024. Now here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 78 points on the day to finish at 22,751. The Dow was up 210 points to 40,211. The S&P 500 was up 15 to 5631. And the Nasdaq was up 74 points to finish at 18,472. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 31 cents to 8190 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 16 cents to 217 US. Gold was up $10.02 to 242145 US an ounce, and silver was down 7 cents to 3067 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $7.54 per bushel, barley is at 577, canola is at 1394, and corn is at $6.99 per bushel. Live cattle August contract was down 25 cents to 182.13. Feeder cattle August contract was up 13 cents to 258.78. Lean hogs were down 5 cents to 88.65. And the Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 73.10 US. Recapping one of our top stories, the FBI is investigating Saturday's shooting at a Trump rally in Pennsylvania as an attempted assassination and act of domestic terror. However, authorities say a motive has not yet been identified, and it appears there may have been some security failures that allowed a gunman to uh, get such a vantage point and open fire at the former U.S. president while killing also a rally attendee. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Deftari, will have details for us shortly. And when you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to, to check out our number of our stories and our interviews. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. Come and enjoy the 15th season of the Lethbridge Shakespeare Performance Society's Summer Stage as they proudly present William Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. This comedic play revolves around mistaken identities, love triangles, and hilarious predicaments. Performances are free to attend and donations are gratefully accepted. For locations and showtimes, visit Lethbridge Shakespeare Performance Society's Facebook page. Lethbridge Sport Council's Outdoor Roving Gyms program takes place Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to 11 a.m. at rotating locations. This program is for kids ages 5 and under and their caregivers. Come and enjoy an hour of fun and get active. Pre-registration is required to attend. For locations and to register, visit lethbridgesportcouncil.ca slash roving gyms. And that's today's Bridge City News Community Calendar.
family of Donald Trump is grateful that the former U.S. president is still alive after a gunman opened fire at a campaign rally in Butler, Pennsylvania on Saturday with a bullet grazing Trump and leaving a bystander dead and two others critically injured. To talk more in depth about this is our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari, editor-in-chief of the Foreign Desk, who joins me now from Los Angeles. Lisa, welcome back to Bridge City News. Great to have you on. So, Lisa, can you maybe help us unpack what happened at Saturday's rally? I know there's a lot. There. It was an yeah, an assassination attempt. Um, I think for all of us, it was just finding out. It was just like, oh my god, you yeah. know, it, it's um, as, as one political commentator put it, you know, it's shocking but not surprising, which is an interesting way to put it. In that you shock that it actually happened, but you're not surprised because of the political climate that we're in, um, because of how divided our nation is. Um, and, you know, when, as many people have said, uh, when you go around, um, as the Democrats have, calling Donald Trump a Hitler, um, a, a dictator, somebody who's, you know, a threat to democracy, well, someone who's a threat must be eliminated. So there will be a crazy person, and, and that person alone carries the responsibility, but you have to, you know, talk about the political environment that has been created. Never in, in my life has there been such a divided America where you know the, the media takes a side, the FBI has taken a side, you know, the, the school systems take sides. Um, there is a politics po the politics, I should say, in every single you know important institution of our lives here in the United States that has created distrust. Um, and I think that that is really um, the, the takeaway here is that there's so many questions now, more questions than there are answers. You know, how did the S a Secret Service allow someone to be on a roof, whether they were, you know, um, fans or if they were, you know, this assassin? Um, how can anyone be, you know, how could they not have surveilled the area in a proper way? When you watch the footage, you have questions. Why are they still holding him up instead of holding him down? Uh, you know, giving the, the, the gunman maybe another opportunity to hit him um you know and again we're we're not in the shoes of the secret service you know there have been a lot of accusations whether it's the dei culture um that has maybe put in people who check off certain boxes but don't have the the, the proper training or ability um where you know merit is not a question but you know the boxes that you check off is is more important um we don't know again there's so many questions and so many accusations flying around about the secret service about you know you know what what the white house has said in the aftermath so it's going to be an interesting week. Yeah, and I mean, you touched on a lot there, and of course, mentioning Secret Service. So it appears that there may have been some security failures that allowed that suspected gunman, this 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks, to get such a vantage point and open fire. I mean, there's so much speculation about this. Are you able to kind of unfold that a little bit more? Right, there are some videos where you do hear some people in the crowd saying something about someone on a roof. Um, and, and TMZ of all media outlets, you know, a, a TMZ for those who aren't familiar is an entertainment, basically tabloid. They're the ones who follow the stars and see what they're doing and see what restaurants they're going to. And, and this person gave the video to TMZ where you actually hear people saying there's a guy on the roof and showing this person actually took video footage of the guy laying down um, on his on his belly, it seems, or on his side, um, waiting to to shoot. Um, so many questions regarding the Secret Service. What, you know, why didn't they listen to people in the crowd? You know, obviously, you want to be very, very, very careful about every threat, take every threat and and every you know warning you get and every um, hint you get, kind of um, seriously. This is a, a tip that was given by the audience that that detected someone on the roof. Why wasn't he taken out at that point? A um, lot of questions about why this was allowed to get to the point that it got to. And again, the bullet, when you watch, and I know so many um, different outlets have shown the picture of the brain, showing the angle at which Donald Trump had turned his head, had he turned differently, 
he wouldn't be here uh, right now. And again, that was the goal of the shooter. Um, very, very serious security lapse. Yeah, exactly. It could have been a very scary Kennedy moment right there for everybody watching on Saturday. And of course, Lisa, like there seems to be a lot of information surrounding this. We have to be careful about conspiracy theories and misinformation, but we are hearing reports that a police officer encountered the shooter before he fired at Trump. So Lisa, can you confirm any of those reports? Yeah, these are, you know, Jeanette, I, I appreciate you doing such, you know, an, an, an ethical and careful job at reporting all this, because as I said, there are more questions than answers. These may not be accusations, these might, might not be conspiracy theories, but they're they are valid questions as to how this happened, how this person didn't come under scrutiny um, beforehand. And look, he's 20 years old. As much as, you know, he did have a weapon in hand and he had a motivation although we're hearing that we still don't know his motivation. His motivation was to kill Donald Trump. I think it's as simple as that. Uh, but what was going on through his mind and, and you know what, what truly inspired him to come out that day, at the same time, he's not a trained sniper. He is not somebody who should have, have evaded authority. And the fact that there is this report out there that he did come under um, you know, police surveillance, that has created tension between local police and the Secret Service. Look, law enforcement should have been working together to secure this perimeter. This is not something where you can pass the buck and say, well, it was their fault. It's not our fault. It's that, you know, their goal is to create these, you know, this safe perimeter uh, around any speaker, particularly Donald Trump. Um, and, you know, again, People are pointing to certain things that were said by uh, President Biden about a bullseye, certain things that were um, said about giving him less security because of his uh, um, legal troubles. Um, you know, when it comes down to the day of, when it comes down to the moment of when you're seeing someone on a roof, I mean, there, there shouldn't be this lap. So um, I know that the Secret Service, I know that um, even the White House said that they're opening up an investigation. Um, again, a lot of questions. And I do hope, the only thing I truly do hope, twofold, one, that the media takes a more honest position, regardless of Democrat, Republican. This, these are nonpartisan issues, just like when we saw the debate, you know, the, the media came out and said we were dishonest about, you know, his, um, you know, Joe Biden's, um, you know, how, how old or, or frail or unable he is. And they have hidden that from the, the audience. And for about a week and a half, we heard this, well, the, the, the media needs to be more honest. And then all of a sudden, when we saw headlines about this, it was, you know, Donald Trump's rushed off of stage. There was an incident. No, this was an assassination attempt. And the more honest that we could be, the more we can come together as a nation. If this is if this is happening to a Republican candidate, that means this could happen to a Democrat uh, candidate. And that is the bottom line. This is a security lapse. It affects all Americans equally. Yeah, uh, for sure. Now, I mean, I was watching on Saturday from my vantage point, which is just the one camera. It looked like Secret Service were doing their job, but obviously there's other things going on and other vantage points there, which uh, I didn't see. But uh, I understand there are even former Secret Service agents saying that this breakdown in security was, quote, obviously an abysmal, it was an abysmal failure. So, you know, are you hearing this as well, Lisa? I am. In turn, look, there's a few different things that I want to touch upon. Okay. Number one, just the quality of uh, and, and professionalism of Secret Service. There has been, you know, it, it, I've heard again, like you said, uh, formal, former uh, Secret Service, um, you know, professionals who have said, it's impossible for this lapse to have occurred. Um, this was just a big failure and there's nothing more we can say about it. Um, that that in and of itself is, is a big question across the board. How did this happen? Meaning, were they not prepared? Did they get an order to stand down? Uh, did they just miss this, which is impossible? How did they miss this? Um, there's a picture, there's this footage of um, one of the Secret Service um, uh, officers, a female, where she's just playing around with her gun as they're trying to get Trump into the um, in, out of out of the location. 
Um, and I heard, you know, someone, uh, you know, an, an expert say, you know, why was she even doing that? She should have been all eyes on the situation, aware of her surroundings. Could there be a, another, you know, follow up attack? Um, and again, why is that? Is this because of DEI policies? Is this because the people that day were just off, you know, their mark? They're the ones who failed and they're human and they made human error. I mean, what was it that caused this failure? But the fact that we do have professionals calling this out, again, is a red flag. It needs to be investigated. And I do hope that we do get an honest investigation so that these wrongs could be righted in, in, the, in a, hopefully the next time. And right now we're leading into the RNC, the convention. Obviously, there has to be top-notch security there and at the DNC and, and just moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what do we, you touched a little bit on this earlier. What do we know so far about the suspected gunman or about the, the gunman that's now dead? Yes. Yeah, um, look, 20 years old, um, he was a registered Republican, which makes sense because in um, in Pennsylvania, you can't vote in the primaries unless you are registered for that party. So in order to vote against someone in that party, you need to be registered in that party. So a lot of people, not a lot, I mean, I don't know the numbers, but it is a trend among especially younger people to register for the, um, the party that you are against and kind of vote defensively in, in that way. So that makes sense. And then he gave a small donation, about $15, to a PAC that was um, or oriented with left left-wing causes and left-wing um, candidates as well. Um, other than that, it looks like he came from a military family. He lived locally in Pennsylvania. Um, and of course, you know, obviously a, a disturbed individual who carries all the responsibility for, for the man who died, um, a very tragic and- Yeah, I and was gonna say, more death. importantly, there was an innocent bystander who right. was killed and, at the And rally. he should be spoken more of. I'm very happy to hear there's a GoFundMe um, campaign that Tre President Trump has also endorsed. Some big names gave big amounts of money. Their goal was to raise a million dollars for his family and, and it has already surpassed three and a half million dollars. And I, I hope that that continues to rise because this was so incredibly senseless. And for him to shield his family and to um, you know take the bullet literally to the brain, there was brain mat. I mean, it, it's it's graphic if you, if you want to see the, the footage, but um, so, so senseless for somebody to just attend a political rally um, and to, to lose his life that way. And, uh, and, and their former fire chief as well, somebody who has dedicated his life to helping save lives and save others, for him to lose his life in this senseless and tragic way is just horrific. Our prayers with his family, of course. And Lisa, despite all of this, uh, President Joe Biden is calling for civility in politics following this event that unfolded on the weekend. And I saw his speech on Saturday and, you know, say what you will about Biden. I thought he did and said exactly what a president was supposed to do and say. He was compassionate, succinct and condemned any violence and he didn't make it about himself. And I, it didn't look like he was reading from a tele teleprompter either. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this is this is that this is his moment to say that and do that and step up and we also heard from you know president former president obama um and 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 many others in the political um arena about this and they all said the right things they all tweeted the right things um but many people are upset because they feel as though you can write a book of all the tweets, all the commentary, all the speeches that have been made by very high-ranking Democrats that have called President Trump a threat to democracy. They have called him a literal Hitler. They have said, you know, he's a tyrant, he's a dictator, he's going to uh, change the course of American history and creating an environment where, well, if he's Hitler, he has to be killed. And if I do that, I'm doing society a favor. Um, and so a lot of people are upset and saying it's too little, too late when you've already said such um, divisive and very damning things that are just factually untrue. He's not a Hitler, of course. How do you feel this might change? You think it'll get, but I mean, and, and how, you know, also has this attempt on Trump's life affected his support? I mean, some political analysts believe the sympathy he's receiving could result in a landslide victory. What do you think is going to happen there? It's interesting because the media is not really, I mean, the mainstream media is not really allowing him to 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 play victim here, um, which is interesting because, you know, the left, they, they basically run their meritocracy through victimhood. So can he have a, a little bit of that since he was almost killed and, you know, assassinated? But it's all right because he, he doesn't want to be portrayed as a victim. He was out um, on the golf course in Bedminster, New Jersey at his club there, or he was taken uh, after the event and when he was released from the hospital. Um, look, 
you know, I don't know whether the polls are showing that he he did pick up some points. Now, what I have seen is more of a reason for people to come out in support of him. So we already saw Bill Ackman, who's a very um, wealthy and, and, and visible d Democrat donor, come out and say, I'm supporting Donald Trump. I've actually wanted to support him for a very long time. And I wanted to come public with this, but I didn't uh, for many reasons, because I also thought I needed a long explanation and I just didn't have time to write this explanation. But now that this happened, I'm telling you I'm voting for Donald Trump and Elon Musk as well. Basically, they came out of the closet in terms of, of, of their voting. Now, um, I do believe these individuals had planned to vote for Donald Trump, and this gave them basically a moment to be like, you see, world, you see why we're voting for Donald Trump. It's, there's, there's so much crazy out there. This political environment that has been created is not good for the future of the country, um, and this is this is the candidate that we believe in. And many of those people are very wealthy. They are businessmen, and it makes sense to vote for the guy who is the, the entrepreneur, the capitalist, the one who um, wants to make America great again, and, and they believe in his vision. Now, Again, we don't know how influential this this episode was in actually turning votes, but we do see a, a, a trend now in being more confident about their vote for Donald Trump. Wow, it'll be interesting to see what happens for sure. But Lisa, we are out of time here. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate having you on. Thank you for having me. There are always differing viewpoints when it comes to how our province should be run. Where the focus should be, is it health care, education, the economy? You know, sometimes there are groups which try to influence party policy one way or the other. A new group has been formed in Alberta which is trying to do just that. It is called the 1905 Committee. Joining us now to discuss this is Nadine Willwood. She's the co-founder of the 1905 Committee and she joins us from beautiful Fort McLeod. Nadine, welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you so much for having me, Hal. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. You're welcome. Now, where did the name 1905 Committee originate? Well, I think that number is not unfamiliar to a lot of people. 1905 is when Alberta became a province. And when we were trying to find an appropriate name, I kept um, emphasizing, you know, what if we could do it all over again? And then we kind of thought about, well, the beginning and where we're going. And 1905 Committee is what we came up with. So tell us a bit about your background in provincial politics and explain why you felt the need to start up the 1905 Committee. Absolutely. So my background provincially started actually from a federal perspective. And I had started doing some work with the People's Party of Canada in 2019, 2021. And then when Daniel Smith was elected the leader of the UCP, I thought we would see some true grassroots changes there. And I decided to throw my hat in the ring, um, actually for the Livingston McLeod riding. And I was disqualified, regrettably, by the executive at the UCP. I guess I have very strong and uh, opinions. And uh, that's not always popular with party politics. Um, I'm not, I guess, as easy as to control as they would like. And uh, from there, my background is a chartered investment manager. So I've been obviously following economics for at least two decades. And of course, politics drives a lot of the economy. And so when politics sort of arose as an opportunity for me to get involved, um, I took kind of my background and meshed that a little bit with what I have been learning over the last six years. And thus we looked at what was missing, truly missing in the space as far as true representation by the people. And uh, 1905 was born. So did party officials with the UCP explain why you weren't able to run for the party? Yeah, I have a long letter of uh, reasons. I think the big one, honestly, was just they felt I could not fit in with their team as far as uh, the party goes. Um, my opinions around, you know, things at the time. I have an aerospace and defense background. I have a lot of history and understanding as far as, um, you know, m military industrial complex. And I had a slightly different view on Ukraine and how we should deal with that. Um, they also didn't like the fact that, you know, I, I'm very much, I guess, one of those freedom fighters a little bit as far as COVID was concerned. And not so much a freedom fighter, I just wanted to see the protection of individual rights uh, maintained in our province. And I can go on with a long list, I won't bore you, but those were some of the controversial issues that they didn't want to deal with. So Nadine, what are some of your 
core goals with the organization 1905 committee? So some of the core goals, really, I'd say that if you had to pick one, it's about leadership accountability. A promise made needs to be a promise kept. And it doesn't matter who I speak with from any different political background. Um, they all agree that if, a, if you're going to campaign and you're going to run an election, um, you need to follow through once you've been elected on those promises. And so one of the, the policies that I probably would think our most popular policy that we are now currently pushing here in the next UCP PM is leadership accountability. So you have 24 months to fulfill your campaign promises, verbal or written, doesn't matter. You made a promise, you have 24 months to keep it. If not, you go back to a leadership review and now you have to account to the people who elected you as to why you did not fulfill those promises. So if there's one area I think that everybody can agree on in this province is we need more accountability from our government. Nadine, you just recently launched. What kind of interest has your group been generating so far? We have generated quite a bit of buzz, actually. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of speculation, a lot of rumors, people trying to figure out how we fit into the political spectrum, um, which is great for us because, of course, uh, it's really gotten the word out there. People know we're here and we exist. Um, so it's been, it's been a lot of fun, very exciting. But uh, the reality is, um, you know, we've got Edmonton's attention. And I think that's really what we've been trying to do. And we are attracting people from all different political spectrums and all different backgrounds. Um, obviously, we have a more of a conservative focus, but the principles, we are about principles and policy. And because we're about principles and policy, we really do appeal to a lot more people in a very unifying, unifying kind of way. So how many members would you say you currently have? And are you receiving some good financial support so far? We are getting lots of good financial support, small donations, some bigger donors as well. Um, I wouldn't even begin to guess at this point. I've been so busy just really pushing the agenda, getting out to places like this. I haven't really focused on counting numbers. Um, so we'll have to get back to you with that number. Now, I'm curious to know, Nadine, are you getting a lot of people from the Take Back Alberta campaign, maybe switching over to yours? Um, it's been interesting. We've had a lot of uh, opposition um, in some respects from the Take Back Alberta. Um, there seems to be this thought that we are trying to get rid of Danielle Smith. And there are very much fans of Danielle Smith. And for us, it's not about the leader. It's not about the party. It truly is about accountability. Um, but because some people do feel threatened, I think it's kind of, you know, got people's attention in some respects. Um, we've become a, a, a target for some individuals to come after on the taper back Alberta side. And then there's other people who have been really disenfranchised with the fact that Take Back Alberta has become a little bit more a David Parker organization. Um, it, it served this province so well in so many ways in re-engaging the citizens politically, um, but it, I think it, it, where it missed out was it needed a broader base um, and a, a better foundation. Um, it, you know, it was sort of formed around one concept, get rid of Jason Kenney. And for us, it's about leadership accountability, and we're really going to focus on principles and policies. And I think when people understand that, um, I think some of the fear and some of the threat will go away to some of these other organizations. And we are really something that they can actually be a part of as well. We're not looking to replace anybody. We're just looking to kind of be this bigger umbrella tent where there's a place and a home for everyone. So what is your current view of our Premier, Daniel Smith? I think Danielle Smith has done some things well, um, but I think there's been a lot of campaign promises that have been made that just haven't been kept. And I think there's been some, in my opinion, or judgment decisions made. Um, you know, we did a, a Redford uh, survey poll, and a lot of people didn't agree with the fact that she appointed uh, Alison Redford to a, uh, a Crown Corporation. Um, you know, of all the people in this province, uh, you know, as far as even conservatives, I think Alison Redford is one of the least liked. And I think that was a poor judgment decision on her part. She's promised tax reduction. 
Um, she hasn't followed through on that. But, and it, for me, it's about priority. If you're going to, you know, talk about a high speed train between Calgary and Edmonton before reducing taxes, as you have promised in your campaign, I think, again, that's a lack of judgment. Let's talk about some of the campaign promises from our Premier Daniel Smith. One of those being amending the Canada-Alberta Cooperation on Immigration. Alberta does need people, but you believe perhaps similar to Quebec, we should be a little more cautious about who comes to live here in Alberta? Absolutely. Economically, you you know, you have to have the economy able to keep up with the number of people that are coming into the province. And we have migration, I think, issues as well. We have a lot of people moving to Alberta because Danielle has rolled out the welcome mat. And uh, she's even commented that we need 10 million or she expects to see 10 million people in the province in the next 20 years housing, economy, jobs, we just do not have the capacity for that. And so I think we need to take a very realistic approach with what realistically we can accomplish, what we can do. And again, you know, Quebec is a very distinct society, but so is the West. Alberta has a very specific, distinct culture, history, and I think we risk losing that. Um, by allowing too many people into the country without proper measures to integrate them properly into our society. Now, Nadine, you would like to see the UCP get the province back to a flat tax. Why do you feel that's so important? And how soon would you like to see that implemented? Well, two reasons, actually. Um, you know, we had an Alberta advantage for a long time, and it was one of the least expensive places to live, and business boomed here, entrepreneurs burned, um, freedom really flourished. And I think if we could get back to that, and I think taxes is a huge part of it. Right now, Alberta is not an inexpensive place to live. We pay a lot in taxes. And I voted instead of just reducing taxes to go to a flat tax for two reasons. Not only does it keep more money in the pockets and the genes of Albertans, but it also will help with political favors. If everybody is paying the exact same and everybody see one rule of law that applies to everybody equally, then it's very difficult for politicians to use tax dollars to gain political favor. Now let's discuss leadership accountability for just a moment here. You believe the party brass should implement a mandatory leadership review two years after an election if campaign promises haven't been fulfilled. Who would really determine this? I think if we put that into a policy at the UCP, um, at the NAGM, everybody votes on it and we really push this through. Politicians honestly believe that they are held accountable once every four years at the polls. And the greatest amount of influence I think we as individuals have are at the AGMs and at the political party level. And so I think if we can, as a grassroots movement, we're supposed to be a grassroots organization, can push a policy like this, it holds politicians to account. The worst thing I think that can happen with a politician is they get too comfortable. And I think being a little uncomfortable and knowing there are people watching and now they are accountable for what they say and have to follow that through with appropriate action is the best way to return politics to a more grassroots, honest, open, transparent way of working. You know, with a new job, there's a probationary period. Some companies have three months, six months. Maybe we should do the same thing for our politicians. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. You know, you and I are accountable for the jobs that we do. Um, you know, we have to be doing a good job. We have to be accountable for what we say. And if not, you know, we need to either be replaced and or, you know, we need to say, OK, what do we need to do to improve? And so this is a great way, I think, for uh, everyday citizens to provide feedback to their politicians. Now, your website declares constitutional convention. Alberta resolves to initiate and promote constitutional reforms with other provinces, focusing on key priorities such as equalization, access to tidewater, and health, health transfer payments. How do you really envision this happening? Well, I think everybody will agree that Alberta hasn't really gotten a fair deal with the federal government. And I don't think Ottawa is really ever going to sit down with us to discuss how we can get a truly fair deal. Um, so I think the focus really needs to be speaking with what, much like what you're seeing with Saskatchewan now and Daniel Smith. They're kind of aligning 
um, which is a more unified and a bigger camp to take on some of the federal policies. Now, if we can bring BC into that conversation and Manitoba into that conversation, um, I think that's the way to go. So Alberta trying to do it on its own, you know, Saskatchewan trying to do it on its own. Um, I don't think we're going to get really anywhere with that. So I think what we really need to do is have the conversation with the provincial premiers and really come up with those policies and then push those policies forward as a united force. And so constitutional convention, I think, is the, the right way to do that. Um, it hasn't really been effective even in the U.S., but, um, you know, we have to start somewhere. And I think it's a good place to start the conversation. Nahad Nedji, the former Calgary mayor, is now the new leader of the Alberta NDP. And the race wasn't even close. He took like something like 67,000 votes, about 86% of the vote. How should the UCP respond now to this, seems like a very popular candidate and the new leader of the Alberta NDP? Well, I think realistically, the UCP has to play its own game. Um, we have to, we have our own policies, we have our own viewpoints, and I think we really need to continue to grow our base, but not trying to win over the left. Um, I think realistically what we need to do is be really strong, really accountable, be open, transparent, and I think that's what people are looking for. They are, I honestly believe people are so done with politics. Why? Because they go, oh. You know, that's just politics. That's politicians. This is what they do. And I think we can do it better and we need to do it better. And I think if we can honestly show people that politicians show that people, they're listening to what the people want, what people have to say and get back to the proper role of government. And I think that's where a lot of people have gotten confused. You know, there's a lot of benefits and a lot of political favors, but, you know, those are pet projects. Let's get back to basics and um, let's be open and transparent. You know, Danielle Smith promised uh, when she was with the Wild Rose, smaller government, smaller spending. And what did she do? Bigger government, bigger spending. And I think people in Alberta would be happy to see a limited government that's restrained in its spending, keeping more dollars into the pockets of Albertans so that they can be the ones to grow the economy. Government's not productive. Businesses, individuals, that's where the productivity comes from. And as you know, it's been pointed out so many times today, even the OECD, you know, Canada is not uh, a very good place to be right now as far as production goes. And I personally believe that's because government has just become too big and the budgets are just too large. And, you know, the private sector through regulation has been beaten down and we have to start removing those obstacles. Nadine Wellwood is the co-founder of the 1905 Committee. Thanks so much for joining us today from beautiful Fort McLeod. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks so much for watching.